Back in March I showed you a basic and free way of creating PBR materials. By now I have created more than 200 textures for my website cc0textures.com and today I will show you the way that I used to create many of my textures, this time using some paid software. In this tutorial I will use Microsoft Eyes, which is free, Krita, which is also free, Affinity Photo, which is around 50 bucks, and Substance B2M by Allegorithmic, which sits at around 100 bucks. In this tutorial I will not cover how to shoot the images required for this process, since that process has not changed from the last tutorial, so in that case I recommend that you watch this other video first. With that out of the way, let us begin. So here I have my source images in the NAV file format, so it's raw, straight from the camera. And now we can start with the first step, that is combining all of the images into one large image. For that I'm going to use the image composite editor, so just take all the images and drop them in there. Okay, now here in this first sort of step called import, um, you can delete any images that you don't like uh, and you can also choose the panorama mode. In this case we are going to set it uh, to auto detect, so just leave it. Um, this usually works fine, um, if you're having trouble you can try out um, some of the modes, you will probably need planar motion or planar motion with skew or with perspective because that's what's basically happening here. We are moving along a plane, so it's called planar motion. But in 99% of the cases, auto detect just works fine. Then go over to the next step called stitch and let it chew through the images. Now this might have an impact on my recording because of high CPU usage. So I'm going to be left for a while and I'll just let it process all of these. So after just around 90 seconds of processing, this is what we end up with. You can now see we have one big image and you can even see how it stitched these images together. We have like one sticking out here a little bit. Um, but you can also see that the perspective is still wrong and we are going to fix this later on. For now just move on to the next step, cropping. In here you can crop your image if you want to. Um, for example if you already know that you're not going to use this part you can just crop it out. Um, but I, I'm going to do all of this later on in Affinity Photo so I'm just going to leave it at no crop like this, the full image and I'm going to export this. Now when exporting this it's very important that you choose a another file format because the default is JPEG 75 which doesn't really work for textures. So set it to something lossless like um, PNG and then just click export to disk and save it into a folder. I'm going to use this folder for the tutorial. I'm going to call that um, stitch. And I'm now going to close down the software and if we go in here to the project folder you can now see that we have one big stitched image um, which contains all of our original images and which we can then use for further processing. Alright, now we can take our 149 megabytes big stitched image and open up our second tool for today which is Affinity Photo or Photoshop or maybe even GIMP. 
although I find the perspective tools in GIMP to be a little bit lacking, so I would recommend using Photoshop or Affinity instead because they work a lot better for this editing process. So drop in your image and we can start. So the first thing that you want to do is to crop your image down to a square. So go to cropping on the left side and set it from unconstrained to one by one. And then just roughly mask out the area that you want in your texture. Now Affinity Photo still saves this part of the layer, the outside part of the layer, even if you crop your image. So you don't need to worry about like losing data in this case. Just roughly go in there and select the area, like so. Apply that and then we can move on to our perspective correction. Because if you look here, the mortar between the bricks, it literally is, is like slanted. It looks slanted in this image. Um, and that's just wrong and we absolutely need to correct for that. So go to the left hand side perspective tool and now you'll get this grid and you can also see how it saves the entire layer even though only this part is visible. Go in here and disable the grid because that just gets in the way. Also make sure that snapping is disabled because that also likes to get in the way and then just start start aligning the horizontal lines between the bricks. So let me move that out of the way. So roughly like this. Take your time with this step because if you do this properly then everything after that becomes a lot, a lot easier. So don't skimp on this. Also, one thing that I'm doing is I'm making sure that um, the brick pattern itself is um, not perfectly, but at least decently aligned. So if we look over here on the right side, we have a lot of short ends like here and here and here and here and so on. Whereas on the left side, we have a lot of like long ends of the brick, like this one and this one and this one. Mm. And this is really important when um, editing the image in Krita, when making it seamless. Um, because otherwise, is if you just take like this really short end from a brick and try to combine it with like a really short ending, maybe this one, um, then you'll get a very odd looking brick which will jump out and you will need to do a lot of cloning work and a lot of patchwork in order to actually build enough artificial brick out of this. Um, so make sure that you your pattern at least decently aligned is it is at least decently aligned so that you don't have to do this for every single brick but only maybe for a few of them. This will save you a lot of time. Also think about the mortar in between the bricks um, at the edges here at the bottom because if you look here here we have like a full line between them captured in the image and if we go up we also have almost a full line so if you try to combine them and later on tile the image you'll have a huge gap here and that's also not good so move this part up a little bit so that you have almost no seam in here like this and now if we try to tile this image later on we can use the seam from the bottom for the top and we don't get any unnecessarily large gaps okay I'm going to move the bottom part of the image a little bit more. Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. I think we're there. This should do it. So apply the filter. And I'm also going to make use of the, of the fact that we are in Affinity Photo, which in my opinion is a lot better for basic image editing like brightening and stuff like that than Krita. Um, and I'm going to take care of this little shadow that we have in there. Like if you look at the um, original image, we've got a lamp on the wall, which drops a little shadow. I deliberately included this so I can now edit it out. Um, and you can see we have this little dark part over here. So um, go in here to the dodge brush tool and just carefully brighten up your image. Again, you can also do this in Krita, um, but I find the tools in Affinity Photo to be much more suited for that. Since Krita is mainly a painting software and this is made for image editing. So if you have obvious shadows like this, try to edit them out as early as possible. Okay, this is good. We now have a perspective corrected image, which we can now make seamless. So export it, for example, as a PNG file. Again, we don't want to lose any data. Oops, that's, that's some testing images, some practice. And I'm going to call this one um, perspective, like so. There it is. So time for the next software. Now, if you look at this and you maybe know Krita, um, you might ask, why are we using Krita? Why should I use another tool uh, for something that I can also do in Affinity Photo? Now, the reason is that Krita has one really cool feature that I have not seen in another image editor, at least not in GIMP and not in Affinity Photo. And that is the tile view mode. So if you press W, you can see that we now have like a tiled view of our texture and we can zoom out and check how the tiling looks. But we can also still zoom in and edit our image and all the these tiles will actually copy this this edited version immediately and we can even clone from one side of the image so this is basically the right side of the image that you're seeing here over to the left side of the image that you're seeing here um, and that is a really cool feature for editing textures so go to your brush presets get out your clone brush um, and just start working so I'll start it in the bottom left corner here. Um, just press Control to set a point and move over here. And this is how I um, remove all of the, the seams in these bricks. Just go along there and carefully, basically overwrite these edges with some clean image parts like so you can now see that this bricks brick seamlessly transitions from one p side of the image the left side to the right side 
and it's beautifully connected. Now don't forget to do that with the mortar in between, like this, and then just keep going. This again, this is again, this is a very um, time-consuming process. So maybe just listen to some music or podcast or something while doing this and just take your time and make sure that you don't have like tiny seams in here left because that's a bit ugly. Okay, now here this is one of the these cases that I've talked about. This brick looks a bit unnatural. It's way longer than it should be. So we'll have to split it somewhere in order to make it look right. So just um, look in your image for a nice seam between two bricks that have like similar color. Maybe I'll take this one. So just place your clone origin there. And then just fake a seam between the two. like this and this looks much better than it used to and now just keep going I'll probably do this as a t as a time lapse and I'll see you later So now that we have a seamless image, we, we only have to do some minor adjustments. For example, take a look at this um, ventilation hole. I think it's for ventilation. I have actually no idea what this is. Um, but you can see it's a bit annoying. It keeps repeating, obviously. So it's a bit obvious. It shows where the texture has been tiled. So I'm just going to clone this out from here. And now as a final step, um, just zoom out and um, check for any other things that might jump out to you. So in this example, you can see 
that we have one brick in particular which is very dark and which always stands out a little bit and it doesn't really look look good because you can you can tell where the texture starts to repeat itself so in this case what I I would just do is again hmm, either brighten this up use like a brightening brush in affinity photo or in Krita if, if Krita even has that um, or just clone it out again because let's be honest no one is going to notice that like seriously in these textures uh, there are some textures in which I've cloned quite a lot of, of things and you just don't see it because it just gets lost in this pattern so just like so make sure that you don't clone over the edge here because if you do it this way then you can even sh keep um, the unique shape of the brick and this makes it even less noticeable like this and if we now zoom out you can see that the tiling of the texture looks a lot better now again if you really want to go in on the details you can also do this for this brick and you can start brightening up this entire row over here until you've got like a really flat texture um, but for our intents and purposes this is fine we're going to keep this and we can now export this and generate our maps I'm going to call this seamless.png that's our third image And once that has finished exporting, there it comes. Um, we can go over to Substance B2M. So take your image, seamless.png, drop it in there, and you'll get this little dialog. Select Load in Main Input Tweak. This basically means load it as the main image of your texture, or of your material. Now it's no longer just a texture, now it's a material. But you can see we have some problems. So I'm going to increase the output size up here to 2048. And this just makes our problem even more obvious. You can see that um, the displacement is all over the place because the software has actually no idea how to treat a brick texture like this. So even if we go into the relief settings, which are here, and uh, play around with like the frequencies, which allow us to um, to decide how the software should treat small bumps, medium bumps, and like really the fine details. Even if we do that, we can't really get a decent result like this. You can see it even more obvious if you um, go into the 2d view and then to the height option like you can see uh, that there's basically no real correlation between the bricks and the mortar when it comes to the height map you can see this part is dark this part is light and the the mortar is just everything it can be almost white but it can be almost black like here like this and that's not a very good displacement map. That's not useful at all. So we'll have to do some manual adjustments, which is why I'm going to open up Affinity Photo again. All right, and I'm going to drop in our now seamless image because what we basically need to do now um, is we need to 
create what um, substance b2m calls an optional tweak or a height tweak map um, so basically we are going to create our own very basic displacement map that's going to help substance b2m understand our material a little better and to do that i'm going uh, i'm going to create a black and white version of this so go over to your adjustments and select black and white and if you're doing this in affinity and i think also photoshop um, you get this really nice um, black and white creator um, where you can basically choose the brightness of the individual colors so you can see right now it's basically um, just everything is just light gray and that's just the problem uh, that we had in, in substance b2m where it couldn't process the material um, because everything is just grayish but what we can do now is we can use these color tweaks to actually increase the value of for example the red bricks so go in there and just draw up the red to 300% and also the yellow and you can see we start to get a lot more contrast between our bricks and the mortar now the green one doesn't really have an impact on this image so I'm just going to leave it the cyan cyan is basically the color of the mortar so draw that down you can now see the contrast is getting even better same thing goes for the blue and the magenta and now you can see we have a really nice not finished but really nice um, displacement helper and to make this even more useful I'm going to um, go over to the color curves and just tweak that a little bit because you can see the darkest part of the image is still not quite black it's sitting at somewhere around like 0.25 25% of the maximum brightness so I'm just going to drop this down you can use uh, this curve here to know where to put these points for adjustment because you can clearly see we've got one bump that's um, the mortar the seams and we then we've got another bump that's the bricks so I'm going to draw down the mortar then draw up the bricks again relatively quickly like this yeah this looks fine um, and I'm also going to export this image and I'm going to call it something like um, displacement um, adjust All right, so back in B2M, we can now import our new adjustment map. So just go in here, drop it in, and now don't select main input, obviously. Select height, optional tweak. Now it's not going to have an impact immediately, but now if we go over to relief, we can select relief input which is at off by default but now we can say height input and it still doesn't have an effect but we now have this relief input opacity and once we start raising that we should see an effect yeah you can see the mortar is starting to drop down here yeah and now you can see our brick pattern actually has some displacement associated to it. Now it obviously looks genuinely horrible, like it's way too uh, spiky, it's way too rough. So um, to avoid this, because this looks way too rough, this looks like uh, the sort of displacement you get 
if you try to generate displacement maps in GIMP, which is something that I did, but that's something you shouldn't genuinely do. Um, so I'm going to blur out this soft, uh, this input input a little bit. So go to the height input softness and just increase that a little bit. Again, in, in Substance B2M, a lot, of, uh, a lot of your success just depends on playing around with the values long enough. There's just a lot of manual, manual tweaking that you need to do until you get it right. In this case, the entire brick, brick texture becomes a little bit too soft if I increase this input softness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the relief balance um, and increase the high frequencies there. So what I'm basically doing is I'm not using uh, the high frequencies or the fine bumps from the from the displacement map that we created ourselves. I'm instead going to rely on Substance B2M for the high frequencies like this. They have a lot of impact. And I'm going to use um, my new created displacement map, my newly created displacement map that I made um, myself for the large scale displacement with the bumps in here. All right. So looks good so far. One thing you might notice is the the seams in here. They're almost black. This looks almost like a bug. It looks like like there's something wrong with the texture. But nothing is wrong. We just have a lot of ambient occlusion. So to fix that, go over to your ambient occlusion settings. And ambient occlusion, in case you don't know, that's basically a map which um, later on in the renderer gets multiplied with the color map of your texture and you can use it to create like really fine shadows. For example, if we take this base color map, then these parts should become a little bit darker later on um, when rendering because they are in between these two bricks and the bricks are throwing shadows at them. But if you don't have an actual displacement, for example, in a game engine, when you're working with a very low poly object, then you need to use this map um, to basically fake some shadows onto the bricks. The problem that we have right now is that this map is way too strong. Like you can see, it's completely black in these seams. And this means that, as we can observe it, the seams themselves are also completely black and that's not what we want. So go to your ambient occlusion map in the 2D view and go to your AO balance and then just decrease these impact values for the or these balance values for all frequencies basically. Yeah, high frequencies. I'm going to okay, I'm going to leave the high frequencies like this. So we still have a bit of ambient occlusion. And if we now go back to our texture and maybe decrease the visible displacement a bit, the displacement height, then you can see that we get, we are starting to get a really great looking texture, a really cool material. Yeah. But we are not yet done, not entirely. We're getting there. Um, we still have to do the roughness channel. So this is the roughness channel by default. Um, it's already not bad because um, if you think about it on a brick wall, the mortar and the brick, they don't really have um, a lot of difference when it comes to roughness, they are both very rough, so I'm just going to increase that a little bit. But Substance B2M has a really cool feature when it comes to roughness that I really want to show you. So we are actually going to do some editing um, for this roughness map. And this feature is called roughness from color. So 
just go in here and enable that. And what it basically means is it allow means uh, it allows you to choose one color and give this color um, a different roughness value, which can be extremely useful if you're creating something like reflective tiles with not so reflective um, seams in between them. So go to your color map. And in this case, um, I'm going to make the mortar a bit more, a bit more rough, a bit less reflective uh, than the bricks. So go to your roughness color from color keying color, what a name, um, and click on this little color icon here, which gives you this editor where you can select pick and then just pick out one of the gray values in here. And now you can see, um, or you can not yet see it, you will see it in a few seconds, uh, that if we change this roughness value down here, roughness from color value, um, to be something else, maybe even higher, like 0.89, and then increase the range, which means that we are not just editing this one very specific color value, but all the color values close to it, you can see that the seams the mortar is slowly starting to turn more white, which gives a a bit of variety to the roughness map. And that's very important in making the, the bricks interesting to look at. Now if we go into the 3D view, you can see that we have like a nice bit of variety. It's obviously pretty subtle because bricks are generally very rough, but you can see that here and here, the top is very reflective, whereas in the seams, the mortar still appears very rough. And that's a really cool effect, I think. As a last step, we can also play around with the diffuse color values. So go to the diffuse base color tab and also look at, at the diffuse or the base color map in your 2D view. Um, and here we can do like, do like basic image operations. We can uh, play around with the luminosity which is basically just the, the brightness of the image. Um, we can increase the contrast. I'm actually going to do that. I want the bricks to pop out a bit more. We can increase the saturation. Um, yeah, like this. And then we have another really cool feature called AO cancellation. Um, because if we take a photo of the wall, we obviously have the ambient occlusion included in there. It's it's almost baked in there um, because we still have some shadows like here below this brick or here like this. And this AO cancellation basically allows you to remove that from your image. So if we start cranking that up, you can see that the color becomes a lot more uniform. And actually the contrast is a bit high. I'm going to turn that down as well as these, the saturation. Yeah, like this. And that was our last step. Maybe we can turn down the normal strength a bit because that's a bit extreme. Like this maybe. And here we have our height map, our ambient occlusion map, our normal map roughness map and the base color map. And if we now look at our material, we can see that we have a really nice brick texture that we can even tile to a larger scale. And that is really useful 
for a lot of purposes. So once you're done in Substance B2M, you can just click export as bitmap, select a folder, I'm going to just call this export, select your file format in here and then make sure that you have uh, the correct output size enabled because it's actually the this export dialog is actually going to use the output size that you have defined over here. So I'm just going to set that to 4k 4096 um, because I don't feel like crashing my computer. In fact, even this almost crashes the software in my recording. Um, so I'm going to click export and then we have our final texture. And this about covers it. This texture will go live as Brix11 on cc0textures.com. You can check it out there. Um, if you found this tutorial helpful, you can check out some of the other videos on the channel. So far, they are mostly related to Blender stuff, um, but I plan on making more videos regarding textures and substance designer in the future. So if you are watching this in the future, you might already find a few there. Um, and I will see you the next time.